Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to another Creator Hangout with Kickstarter, um, a weekly series of live Q&As with creators from our community. Uh, my name is Victoria Rogers, and I'm the Art and Photography Outreach Lead here at Kickstarter, um, which means that I work with creators in those categories and help them develop projects. Um, today, we have two special guests that we're really excited to have, uh, Delaney Martin and Tori Bush, who both are part of New Orleans Airlift. Um, they're joining us from New Orleans, of course. Um, we're so excited to have them both here um, and to just tell you a little bit about the organization, though I think they'll be able to do a much better job than I. Uh, New Orleans Airlift is an artist-driven initiative that collaborates and creates with artists and communities across the city. Um, Airlift was founded in 2008 by Delaney and Jay Pennington, and Tori is the programs director there. So for those of you just joining us, the plan is to spend 30 minutes with Delaney and Tori, um, ask them some questions about their work at Airlift, and then also dive into the three campaigns that they've launched on Kickstarter. So please send us your questions. Um, we'll put them to Delaney and Tori, and we'll be taking the questions live. So either on Google Hangouts right here, or also on Twitter via at Kickstarter Tips. Um, it's gonna be really great, and so, I guess while we're while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll get started. Um, so hi, uh, Tori hi. and Delaney. Hi. Welcome. Um, as I said, we're so happy to have you here. Um, what's the weather like out there? <laughs> oh, it's the weather's finally broken a bit. It was really intense uh -huh. for most of August, but we're like, oh, it's only 92 degrees today. Amazing. <laughs> so yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I thought we could just get started by you guys telling us a little bit more about New Orleans Airlift, like the founding story, um, how you got started, and then maybe also your philosophy. Sure. Yeah. So Airlift kind of came out of this idea post-Katrina, post-storm, that artists were coming back to the city, but they didn't really, they truly did not have the audiences, the built-in audiences that supported them before, even on a low level, like you're doing your gig and your friends come out to see you. like. There was just not a lot of people in town. And my co-founder, Jay Pennington, AKA DJ Rusty Laser, um, had this idea that we should take people to Berlin where he found like this very inquisitive audience. And so the name of our overall initiative, New Orleans Airlift actually came from the Berlin Airlift of World War II and Allied Forces brought all these supplies and helped people in East Berlin. So that's how we got our name. And it was a one-time thing um at that time but it sort of spiraled and changed you know we did get 25 artists to berlin eventually that was great and chaotic and fun um and we continued to sort of export new orleans culture like big frida for example or you know as a, a collaborator of ours and you know we helped bring bounce to the world through her um but then as the city sort of shifted and this amazing kind of renaissance of culture and uh, contemporary art particularly started happening in New Orleans and we started looking at ways to bring people to the city always for collaborations with local artists and I would even add that you know as time has gone on again and the city is really kind of getting to be in a better place what New Orleans Airlift is really looking at now is building bridges between communities in the city as well as people from afar. What was your first project in New Orleans? Um, our first project in New Orleans was called um, Pablo Vivant, a wandering, a wandering retrospective. retrospective, in which we brought a, a friend and collaborator from London, uh, Rosie Cooper, who's a performance artist and a curator, to New Orleans and performed a bunch of Pablo Vivants, for my passion, on the back of a truck that went around the city, like a flatbed truck. Um, and sort of interacting with different neighborhoods, and we actually enacted some historical Tableau Vivants, which for people who don't know what that is, it's a, yeah. uh, <laughs> a, human pic a human picture. It was sort of a 19th century pastime after dinner, whether you're in a fancy house or, you know, around the hearth, you would, without the TV or radio, you would kind of create small sets and enact like a famous painting, a biblical scene, vice, virtue, something like that. So it's a fun way of creating a performative experience. And a lot of what New Orleans does is um, a kind of mesh between performance and visual art and installation. Um, so yeah, that was a very first probably imported project we did. Cool. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about the transition that I imagine has been happening um, you know, over the past several years. Like I've been watching a lot of the coverage about 
10 years after Hurricane Katrina. My family's actually from New Orleans. And I'm just curious about what it's like doing public art in New Orleans today and how that's maybe shifted over the past several years. Yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, obviously it's a very different landscape than it was 10 years ago. Um, you know, it's hard to say we've been inundated so much with articles and radio programs and TV shows and, and events, poetry readings, dinners about, you know, the 10th anniversary. And it's sort of, um, it's, you know, a lot to process and take in. I think what, where we are now is sort of going back to what Delaney mentioned about now, rather than bringing in, um, making sure that we're working outside of New Orleans and trying to bring that import export model outside of New Orleans which was so necessary 10 years ago. Now I think what we see it's more important is really trying to build bridges within this city because there still yeah. is a really fractured city as many people call it the tale of two cities with the sort of the redevelopment and where we are right now. So I think that's one thing that we certainly are trying to address in some way. And I think also just in terms of public art, it's really important to remember that New Orleans has a long, long history of public performance and activities mm -hmm. on the street that it's not necessarily true for many other cities our second lines or mardi gras indians um so you know a lot of new orleans airlifts projects actually are these people are our collaborators because we find them incredibly inspiring and in this tale of two cities like it's incredibly um an honor for us to to even find a way to collaborate from a contemporary art perspective so um we've done parade projects we've done a car rally yeah. where you know we basically got people from New Orleans, urban cowboy culture, bicycles, motorbikes, caramel curves, all female motorbike club, um, a bunch of punk kids on their tall bikes. And we had everybody bring out their like most outrageous rides to this field and kind of created this choreographed yeah, Victoria, Fantasy. you were there, right? Yeah, I was oh, there. It was okay. incredible. Well, I to tell you. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's so, so awesome to see um, yeah. and a lot of fun to be a part of. And I'm curious, too, about the broader creative community and how it's engaging with these issues of, you know, post-Katrina development. And if you've seen people, more people come to the city and sort of how, yeah, who else is, is working there with you guys? I mean... You know, it's it's hard to say on one hand, like our population levels have not reached pre-Katrina levels. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, we do have a lot of people coming to the city. Um, we have um, a lot of young uh, people coming, people who are really creative, people who are really interested in technology, which is, you know, doing great things, I think, for the economy. Um, and certainly before Katrina, there was certainly a stagnation going on in the city in that regard. So there's certainly a, um, you know, gentrification happening. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's everything from small gallery initiatives, which, you know, can resemble a small gallery in Brooklyn at times, you know, in terms of the quality of work and where it's coming from. And then there's, you know, big initiatives like Prospect New Orleans, which, you know, a lot of people yeah. still don't know about, but actually is America's biggest um, international, international biennial. biennial. Um, and just the, the numbers. And this has happened three times now and does bring an international audience to the city. So that's done a lot for contemporary art. And again, I think New Orleans Airlift, um, one of our focuses is just to make sure that the culture bearers, not just the Indians, not just the brass bands, but the people like the Caramel Curves on their motorbikes who really add to the pageantry of our city and its beauty and its culture sort of are not left by the wayside of this and it's not absolutely for, for us it's not a like oh we have to make sure everyone's taken care of it really comes from a place of like mutual admiration curiosity um and a desire to truly collaborate new orleans airlift i would say our number one sort of principle is collaboration and the beauty that can come from it Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense, um, and I've gotten a chance to see it live, which is which is great. Um, I think it's actually a great segue. This idea of community and the way that you've talked about collaboration, um, it strikes me as having some sort of resonance with Kickstarter as a place that people come together to support creative projects. Um, and you know, as I mentioned, you've done three, and a lot of folks are, who are watching this will probably be thinking about running a project of their own. Um, so 
I thought it would be great if you could just give us a little bit of background on the on the three different ones that you've done and just sort of situate us in what actually happened um, before we dive in and talk about how it happened and what worked and what didn't. Um, and I also just want a, a reminder to everybody out there that um, you're definitely able to still submit questions. So please send them our way, either on Google Hangouts or um, via Twitter at Kickstarter Tips. Sure, yeah. So our very first Kickstarter, which I'll speak to because it predates Tori, who's now mm -hmm. kicked in and does amazing Kickstarter campaigns with us. Um, I was very nervous. We asked for, I think, $12,000, which felt really extreme at the time. And it was to support this project called The Music Box. Um, it was a collaboration that initiated with the artist Swoon, um, myself, and Taylor Lee Shepard, an artist with Airlift. And the idea was to build a musical house, and um, it's become one of our it's become our flagship project in essence, the Music Box. And I will not lie, having an internationally famous, beloved, wonderful, charismatic artist like Swoon connected to your project certainly helped, and we were able, largely through her reputation and the dreaminess of the project, to raise twice of our our goal. So I think we raised twenty four thousand, and we were. As much as we were kind of amazed at the money and, and the original music box really operated on a very small budget. It was like people who wanted to be there were there. Um, as much as we were amazed by the money, it was really the sense of community and people from Australia and Japan and all over the place coming together to be like, I can't come to this, but that sounds amazing and good luck. And that was such an amazing feeling um, to have that kind of support from people we didn't know across the world. And, you know, I say to people, Today, you know, Kickstarter, great. You might raise some money, you might not, but the huge part of the value of Kickstarter for for me is that kind of platform to speak to a lot of people and to engage them in your project. Yeah, definitely. And then, I guess, could you just tell us a little bit about the other two projects? I'm gonna let Tori do that. Oh, okay, awesome. A, a specialist um, on that. So, you know, the the greatest thing about our second campaign, which was our biggest campaign, is we, you know. With, where the first one, it was an idea. With the second one, it had already been prototyped. And people, you know, over 12,000 people came to the very first Music Box installation. Wow. So we already had a captive audience. So that allowed us to sort of um, really Camera. get more ambitious <laughs> in, our, um, in our ask. So for our second campaign, we asked for $50,000, and what that was for was we were looking to build five new musical structures that were larger, more robust. Um, with the first one, they were prototypes, and so some of them still remain, but many of them were sort of disassembled. Um, and so with this next project, we wanted to create more permanent pieces uh, that were actually made to be modular, so we can break them apart and take them to different places. So that was a really large endeavor artistically and um, in regards to engineering. So we maybe we should say a little bit about music boxes. Have we defined them? Yeah, music box? no, yeah, probably not. Yeah, uh, we said something about musical houses. In essence, yes, the idea was to combine these uh, aspects of New Orleans, our architecture, our performative musical reality that happens on the streets every Sunday, where literally people are jumping up on top of rooftops and dancing for brass bands. Um, to kind of take these influences and make something new out of it. We had an old falling down house originally, and from its salvage, we made the music box, which was a shanty town sound laboratory, as we called it, um, <laughs> of about 11 playable structures with, I think, about 15 instruments built into the floors, the walls, the ceilings. And after all these artists came together, often inventors, visual artists, sound artists, came together and created this sort of harmonious village. We then invited musicians ranging from, you know, kind of unknown street musicians in New Orleans to Thurston Moore, Andrew WK, um, really well-known people, um, Hami Drake, just genius impro improvisers um, to come and bring our musical town to life uh, and give these great orchestral concerts. Um, also, it was obviously an interactive art, community art project. And so, as Tori said, you know, thousands of people came and played the town themselves. So that's what the music box is. And as she was saying, this next edition created these roving, transportable musical houses. And, yeah, and we've done I would one to date. Also add that uh, it's always kind of hard to describe this project as one of those projects you should see. And you can go yeah. to the website, which is www.neworleansairlift.org. 
And uh, there you can find videos and photos. Um, we also have a bunch on Vimeo. I think that brings up, though, like a really important point because you were able to capture the hearts and minds of people um, online on Kickstarter who maybe weren't able to see it and didn't have a sense of it. And I'm just curious how you did that. And maybe you could speak a little bit to your outreach strategy, but also like your key messages strategy. Like, how did you like inspire people to join in and be a part of this with you? Yeah. Um, you know, I think our key messages were, you know, let's create a space of wonder. Um, let's make something really beautiful. You know, to be honest, I think we all sort of come from an artistic background and it's not particularly strategic, but it's really <laughs> heartfelt. So it, with that in yeah. mind, thankfully, um, we try to use really, really lush, beautiful imagery, both in photographs and video. And we worked with a great video team, Tungsten Monkey, the first time around, and they took really great shots of performances and houses and structures and people interacting with them and really creating a beautiful video went so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would encourage your your listeners, watchers to never scrimp on documentation. Um, a huge part of our success, I think, has been our great documentation of many, many of our projects. And uh, sometimes you get favors in, sometimes you just have to pay, mm -hmm. but it's worth it because these things happen and then they're gone. And if you don't have these these documents of it, yeah, and I would even trouble. go further and say, like, you should always pay an editor because it's just worth having a good video editor. Absolutely. That's a really great tip. And it's something that I feel like often people don't realize until after they've paid for the, the person to, to shoot the video. Um, and then they're like, oh, wait, I have all this footage, but um, not really a way to use it yet. Um, I think so the editor is more important than the shooter sometimes, you know. Yeah. Totally, totally. I think, too, you touched on this idea of something that was ephemeral um, and how you work on these projects that just happen in a moment. Um, and I'm curious about how rewards played into that and sort of what does it mean to create a series of rewards as these opportunities to share a project with the public, um, but for something that might not be like a tangible product or um, might just happen at an instance? Like, how did you think about those? And maybe you could tell us a couple about a couple of them. I mean, I think we're really lucky in that we've built this body of collaborators and we called on them um, to help with the campaign. So it was everything from Ranjit Bhatnagar's Invent Your Own Instrument Kit. He's an artist in New York who so cool. contributed to the original Music Box, um, to recordings by people like Thurston Moore at the Music Box, but trying to kind of give somebody something that is tangible and related to the project. Um, and, you know, and just, just also for your listeners, like Ranjit um, wasn't asked to create all this for totally for free. We tried to like, you know, and this is something you have to figure into your budget, pay people for their time and what they're giving you. Sometimes people will donate. It just depends on the level um, of expectation and, and, and plan, complication. Plan that into your ask. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. And budget, how did you, how did you guys think about that? Um, well, we have a lot of experience doing budgets for very strange things. So this is <laughs> we've created um, um, you know first of all we took into account how much time each of our staff was going to take to run the campaign I would totally recommend at least one or two people do a Kickstarter campaign full-time for the month it's running um, just because it's that's what it takes it's a job yeah it's a job, it's a job. Um, and then we broke down what the cost to make each reward was what it would take to ship it um, we figured in the credit card processing fees, we figured in the Kickstarter fees, and then we also figured in, we used a 501c3 um, so that donations could be tax deductible. Um, yeah. And so we also had a small fee that we paid to use that. Um, Did you find that people took you up on that? On the no. tax, okay. That's what I, no, that's what I've heard to you. I had our largest donor requested it. We had yeah. one donor at $10,000 and she asked, for it. But that was it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it sounds like that pre-planning was really core to being able to drive success and figuring out like kind of how much time um, it takes to run a campaign before you even start probably went a long way for you guys. Um, and also yeah. in the pre-planning, the marketing um, campaign. I mean, we 
spent a lot of time sitting down, really building a marketing campaign so that we knew as soon as we started who we were reaching out to. And we already had a network of sort of individual promoters who yeah. knew, loved the project. They were friends of ours. They were artists um, that we would work with. They were family members. They were, you know, musicians that we loved. And so we reached out way ahead of time and asked them and just gave them a sheet like, this is what you should put on your Facebook. This is what you should tweet. This is what you should email people. This is what you should like say to people on the street, you know, and <laughs> making it really easy. It makes it so much like people are so much more willing to do it if they can basically like copy and paste it. Right. Okay. So yeah. making it as easy as possible for the people who are already helping you allows them to help you more easily. And has that has that been sort of consistent throughout all three? Like, have you been able to maintain some momentum? You talked about a little bit from one project one to project two, but for the third project, which is different, and I don't we haven't really talked about it yet, but how did how was that experience running a third project different from the first two? Um, our third project that we did was actually much smaller in scope. Um, we sort of were allowed this opportunity to work in a church in Lower Ninth Ward, um, and so Taylor Shepard came up with a really beautiful project. Maybe Delaney, you want to describe it. And so because we had to move quickly, we sort of made the goal, um, a small goal, which was $6,000. And also the project was smaller in scope. Mm -hmm. um, and so because we already had a like good base of people who supported us on Kickstarter, we were able to achieve that fairly easily. Yeah. The space Rights was really beautiful. Yeah, Space Rights was a project in this decommissioned Lower Ninth Ward Church, um, Taylor, remember him from the Music Box Project. He's an inventor, um, mechanical kind of genius. And he has been rewiring televisions to make them turn into oscilloscopes. So he inputs sound into them. And whatever the sound is, the TVs make these beautiful kind of colorful line-based images. Um, and they were installed in a giant altar in this church. There was about 60 of them. And uh, that was his portion of the project. And then we worked with a bunch of musicians, Airlift as a whole, kind of programmed a community performance series. And it was everything from um, the Lower Ninth Ward Senior Center Gospel Choir did a performance. Wow to um, Nels Klein from Wilco and many other things. He came down and did a collaboration with a local musician, Rob Cambry. Um, you know, it went on and on. Um, there was, I think, about seven performances in total. And it was just a, it was a sweet project that began to self-support itself through ticket sales after the initial Kickstarter investment. So, you know, just thinking about how much you really truly need for a project to get it off the ground yeah. and then what will continue to support it is probably also important. You know, and I don't think everybody who does Kickstarters has this like kind of organizational wherewithal that New Orleans Airlift does. And so I think, you know, we are lucky to have people like Tori and people like, you know, a lot of people who have done this before and people to play different roles. So I just, you know, a Kickstarter campaign can be a lot of work and base your goal possibly on your capacity a little bit as well. It's maybe a thing or bring on more people to help you if you don't have the capacity because it's a big job. Yeah, we brought on um, a great lady, Kristen Melton, and she helped us with, um, you know, like I said, we had this huge marketing plan in advance. And so she also helped us build out a whole calendar for the month of um, content for social media. And so she was like constantly doing the updates on social media and stuff like that. And, you know, it's just really helpful to have somebody whose main focus is is spreading the word. Totally. No, that makes a lot of sense. I think building your team is such a key component that is sometimes underestimated and that you have to really look at your capacity and, and figure out who are those hands that are going to come in and make sure that you're able to, to make it all the way to your goal and to do it the way you want to do it. And um, sometimes that budget includes hiring someone to manage a Kickstarter campaign, like that's not the yeah. worst idea, you know, but make sure you put that budget line item in and they're going to take a portion of your successful project. So it's, an, you know, they have an invested incentive to make it work so they can get paid. <laughs> totally. So I think that's, a, that's a good idea, particularly if you don't have tons of experience, which is not to say that Kickstarter does not make it very easy to launch a project because you guys have a great platform. But um, I think as people become more sophisticated around it, that, you know, there are people thinking really hard on what works and what doesn't work. 
just yeah and i would also add the one of my favorite things about kickstarter is how available um the kickstarter staff is to you oh thanks that would be something i would recommend like reaching out to somebody who works for kickstarter because they do make themselves so available um and talk to them and get their feedback yeah for sure that's great. Um, so I think we've heard about some awesome things that you guys did to make this work so well. Um, I'm curious if there's anything that didn't work, um, things that you would have wanted to know maybe before you started or um, that were an exciting adventure along the way. <laughs> I think, um, you know, one of the things right away that I think about is I think for our large campaign, we had too many rewards. I think mm. it confused people, like they it made them a little indecisive. I think it created a yeah. lot of work for us. Next time I think I would have, I mean, we had something like 20, you know, maybe 30 different rewards. I don't wow. think- That is an I enormous amount. Oh yeah. my God. I don't, I don't remember what the exact number is, but I think it was too much. I think yeah. if we'd pared it down, it would have been better. And you know, as much as I said, having a swoon on board in the project did help in the initial campaign. I was really, really surprised on the second campaign when we got endorsements and uh, premium gifts from like other kind of well-known people, people like there's some more, Andrew WK. Um, I thought, I was like, oh yeah, it's a shoe in These people are gonna make it happen. And they would tweet for us and they would, you know, do these little um, social media endeavors and they had given us stuff. And I was surprised that, you know, that didn't make a huge difference, even with their own built-in audiences. Um, and I think it, in a nice way, speaks to, like, it's important what your project is um, at Absolutely. a core. You know what I mean? And the first time that um, that we at Airlift Brown, our first uh, Kickstarter campaign, the woman working with me at the time, Theo Eliza, was like, it's really important to address the need. Like, why is this project bigger than you? Who is it helping? Because I think... Kickstarter is about help and pitching in to make something happen. And if it feels like a very egotistical endeavor, that's not going to, you know, help a lot of people in return, um, particularly in you're talking about arts projects, right? If it's like a cool yeah. watch that people all get the watch or whatever, if they contribute, I think that that shifts it in a different, that's a different kind of campaign. Um, but I really like to curve words to heart. And when people ask me, should I do a Kickstarter campaign for my album or whatever? That's cool. I just think you want to think about even just for yourself, like, how does this make the world a better place? Because you're asking people to believe in like a larger vision. Yeah, it's that idea of why should a community be excited about this project and yeah. being able to tell that story, I think is really important. Um, and you guys did it enormously well. I mean, it's I, your projects are some of my favorite on the site. Um, so I, you know, as we wrap up, I just wanted to ask what's next for New Orleans Airlift? What's, what's happening? Um, well, you know, last spring, based on the Kickstarter campaign of 2013, we launched the first roving village of musical architecture in um, a big park here in New Orleans. We had over 10,000 people come in six weekends, which was insane. Um, we have a bunch of concerts and that, that village is growing now. We are building some more musical houses, um, one with a Mardi Gras Indian, Daryl Montana, which is incredibly oh, wow. exciting. Um, and so we're adding to our village, which is always growing, and we are getting ready to rove to a new site in the city next year. Um, <laughs> we're doing outposts of musical architecture in other cities. We and we're trying to find a home. We're trying Where? to find a home for ourselves in New Orleans. Yeah, in New Orleans. <laughs> yeah a headquarters. And um, hopefully one day, despite our ephemeral nature, as you pointed out, we hope to have a permanent site for the Music Box in New Orleans that will allow the project really to grow in depth and quality. Right now, when we bring musicians in, they have usually a day and a half to get to know our house instruments and rehearse, and then it's showtime. But we look forward to, you know, really exploring the lengths and depths of what musical architecture could be for our city. And you know, I would just add as a final note that if anybody does have questions, we're really open to talking to people. And so you can email us at info at neworleansairlift.org. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That is so great. Thank you guys for being here um, and for doing this with us. Yeah. Um, it was a lot of fun to have you. Um, and everybody out there listening, thank you for listening as well. Um, thanks for your questions. Thanks for being a part of this with us. And as I mentioned at the outset, we do these every week um, with different creators every Wednesday. So hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thanks, Kickstarter. Thanks, thanks, Victoria. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys.